Thank you. We, this has been a nice progression because we started at the, the national level. We've moved down to, through Ashwin, through this sort of multi-level. Now we're going local here with this um, making red benefits relevant for local people. So we are focused on what we're calling these subnational red initiatives. Um, these include both programs and projects at the local level, government run, NGO run, private sector run, kind of a diversity of initiatives. And since about 2007, hundreds of these have emerged, and then they've evolved, um, and then evolved again. And they're really interesting because they provide on-the-ground evidence for how local could, people could actually benefit or lose, lose out from red. So we're working at, in six countries, Peru, Brazil, Cameroon, Tanzania, Vietnam, and Indonesia, at 23 sites in 190 villages, and have interviewed over 4,500 households. Uh, this, is a, this is a huge, huge labor of love, as you can imagine. And it, not only did we interview all of these households in about 2010, 2011, but then we went back this year and visited them all again and asked them all about their land use and livelihoods and perceptions of, of these red initiatives. So this fits nicely with what Sven and Ashwin and others have talked about, that um, this idea of disentangling red interventions. So you've got the incentives, the carrots, that don't just include sort of what we might imagine as the classic payments for environmental services, but you've got other kinds of subsidies, um, technical assistance, certification schemes, disincentives, which are you know these taxes and regulatory measures, really the monitoring and evaluation, um, enforcement, that's the sticks, you've got the sticks, the carrots, and then these enabling conditions, which are some call the red readiness, you know, the tenure regularization, the environmental education, the, the preparation for some of these other instruments. Um, and so we, oh, I don't know why that, that value is like that, but anyway, um, you know, Ashwin was saying, yeah, there's a mix on the ground of these things, but we actually counted them at these sites, and there are about 467 different kinds of interventions going on. 52% of those were carrots, 18% um, were, were sticks, and then these, these are the rest, which I don't know what that value is. Somebody else can do the math. Those are the enabling conditions. Um, so somebody in the Global Landscape Forum this weekend said, we have a carrots problem. And this graph would show, we, maybe we, we don't, in terms of numbers, we don't have a carrots problem. But interestingly is that of these incentives, only 18% are actually conditional on sustainable land use behaviors. And actually, so then 9% of the total pie are conditional. What does that mean? It means that um, they're not necessarily going to have the carbon and, and land use outcomes that were initially intended. Um, so we looked at this from two angles, the benefit sharing um, discourse, I guess. The first, thinking of that engaging local people in red for greater relevance and design of benefits. And this goes, this follows nicely from Ashwin's public consultation. Um, and so we asked, are local people aware of red in in initiatives and do they participate in design and implementation? Again, this was at the onset of these, these initiatives, so it's important to, to qualify that, but a few years ago, only 22% or so of the households interviewed had heard of RED, and about one-third had heard of the local RED initiative, with the primary source being the implementing organizations. Um, and most of those in all of the countries really linked those initiatives to forest protection. Um, that's what they felt this was about. Um, Importantly, it was at the, the onset of the, the initiative, but there were already activities happening. So um, it's, we say that the, part, the knowledge was low. We're giving the implementers the benefit of the doubt to not raise expectations at that point. Um, but interestingly, Ann Larson is just finalizing a paper that actually shows between, between women's groups and mixed groups, the women's groups were much less knowledgeable than the men's groups, even, the mixed groups, even at this early stage. So, there, there are some interesting issues to explore. Of those who knew about the red initiatives, of those third, 
Um, only about 27% had participated in some way in the early designer implementation, and most of this was passive or consultative, going to a meeting and learning about what was going to be done in the community, but not necessarily having a say about what was going to be done. And then we asked what their hopes and worries were for RED. And the H is the hopes, the W is the worries. And if you go along the horizontal axis there, um, you can see obviously that most local concerns were focused on income and welfare. So we hope that this initiative will improve our incomes. We worry that it's going to it, it hurt our livelihoods, these kinds of responses. We hope that this initiative will protect our, help protect our forests. We worry that it won't be strong enough to exclude the oil palm companies or the timber companies that are causing, causing the problem. You kind of go down the line here. Um, so then, and then we're also asking, that's the participation part, but then we're also asking or saying that it's important to understand local livelihoods for better targeted interventions. So we're asking, can red interventions actually promote social benefits while minimizing burdens at the local level? And here, we looked at some of these local land use practices and livelihoods. And we saw that you know, nearly half of the households in the sample had cleared, at, these, at the red sites, had cleared at least one parcel of forest in the, la in the two years prior to the survey. Most of that clearing was done for agriculture. Um, if we look at household income shares at these same sites, the majority of it, the blue is income share from crops, the gray is from livestock, and the green is from forest. Well, in most countries, it's the crop and livestock income that makes up the, the bulk of the cash and subsistence income locally, with the exception of Peru, where there's um, the Brazil nut site that Ashwin showed, and a timber site in Ucayali. Those forest products are very important. What, what this means is that if you're going to promote forest conservation, if you're going to apply disincentive sticks and say people can no longer clear for sweat in agriculture, which is a pretty common intervention at these sites, there is a risk of, of um, burdens and, and, and actually harming local livelihoods as opposed to promoting benefits. But we did see that there is alignment between red interventions and local livelihoods. So these are kind of the same, same types of figures, but in a different form. So the purple is the share of income from livestock, which at the two, the two Brazil sites here of the sample, livestock is very key, followed by the red, red pie slice, which is crops. Um, and, and actually the interventions that the implementers are, are promoting there are very much focused on livestock, sustainable milk production, best practices for cattle ranching, so they are aligned actually with local livelihoods. Likewise in Peru, um, in Madre de Dios, where Brazil nuts are really, really important share of income, they're actually focusing on this Brazil nut processing plant. In Ucayali, where it's small-scale timber production, they're bolstering FSC certification and trying to, to open new markets for, for that. But livelihood portfolios are heterogeneous. This is the, um, show, it's a proponent, um, sorry, principal component ordination. And essentially what it's showing in a nutshell is that um, you, the red circles, the, the one on the bottom there is a, from Indonesia. And it's essentially showing the bigger size of that circle there means more heterogeneity between communities within the same site. Um, and, and then you can see in Brazil, um, the smaller circle shows that the, the communities in that site are actually more, more homogeneous in terms of their livelihood pro portfolios. This is important because we often find implementing organizations that say, oh, we're going to promote fish farming at this site so that people stop going into the forest to hunt. We're going, and, and they're sort of uniform, one-size-fits-all type interventions that may have very different implications among different kinds of communities that have different livelihood portfolios. And then you look within the community and it gets even crazier, of course. Uh, we know that communities are heterogeneous, um, but it's, it's pretty interesting to look at some of these measures. I mean, this top graph basically shows two communities in Cameroon. The bigger polygon shows that households are very diverse in their livelihood strategies. And the one in the middle shows that the, actually they're a little bit more homogeneous. But if you would just take an average of 
income or um, the kind of portfolios that I just showed, they might look quite similar. Um, so, so there are some interesting things that, you know, pr proponents cannot explore these things, but they do need to recognize the heterogeneity to be able to promote equitable benefit sharing. So in conclusion, we did find sort of generally low levels of early local participation in subnational red initiatives. Um, forest clearing and reliance on agriculture are the most important characteristics of local livelihoods at these sites, highlighting the importance of complementing um, disincentives or sticks with incentives carrots. Livelihood heterogeneity makes it challenging to promote equitable red benefit sharing at the local level. And really the importance of involving local people in developing an equ effective and equitable mix of red interventions. This again links to what Ashen was saying. You know, there was a, we, I went to a community meeting at this site in Brazil and the people were saying, please don't pay us $50 to stop doing agriculture. Instead, can you just give us a cooler for our, so that we can actually freeze our fruit and sell it later on? I mean, these people know what will incentivize them. They know what they want. And so, but we just actually need to listen to them um, to try and understand how best to design these, these initiatives. Thank you.